we're finishing this session on South Africa because the South African Old Vine Project, I think has been, it's a benchmark for solving the, the theme, one of the themes we introduced at the beginning. How do you create a kind of collective identity, a, a category for Old Vine wine that makes co-ops decide, yes, we're gonna bring on an Old Vine wine range. Yes, we're gonna pay more. Yes, we're going to do marketing that convinces consumers of the value, the deeper value of old vines, culturally, qualitatively, um, and, and biodiversitively. <laughs> so um, over to Tim and uh, Rosa Kruger, and I think you'll also be joined um, in a moment by Andre Morgenthal. So I can't see Rosa. Rosa, where are you? Will she pop up on the top? She's there. <laughs> Uh, um, down one. Ah, there you are. How are you? <laughs> well, thanks, and you? Yeah, I'm. I'm enormously well. And and Rosa has very kindly decamped to somewhere with good Wi-Fi, <laughs> haven't you? Yes, with the help of Nadia and yeah. Andre. <laughs> oh, good, okay. And we're just hoping that load shedding is not going to damage us today. Because Checked, and we're safe for the time being. Safe. Oh, fantastic. Listen, um. Rosa, you're kind of the queen of old vines around, around the world. Um, so we're going to divide this into two uh, sections. Are we going to show a quick, vineyard, a quick video first? No, it's just a couple of just four um, pictures. This is the a couple, certified couple pictures. Well, let, let's get on to those in a minute. Uh, the way okay. we're going to divide this is that you're going to, I'm going to talk to you first of all about, about vineyards. And then Andre yes. Morgenthal, who runs the old vine project, is going to come on and talk to us about the structure of the, of the old vine project and about the marketing and the the seal and all those things. So to start with, we, we want to learn from you about viticulture really. Just quickly, because people may not know this, you were a journalist for a while, a political journalist, that was a mistake. And then you studied to be a lawyer and then you got involved in the wine industry. I mean, how? just tell us how you started working in vineyards. And I love your story about how you learned and going to see Evan Archer. <laughs> Tim, let's just, you've asked me this question so many times, so let's just quickly get it over with, okay? You know, I, I don't like questions like this. I studied journalism. I did a master's again in journalism in the late, well, that was many, many years ago, and then worked as a journalist for seven years in the 80s. Uh, during that time, I met my husband, who was a brilliant lawyer. I fell in love with law, and I did my law degree. And I was completing my articles as a junior uh, attorney, uh, wanting to be an advocate like the rest of my family. My family are either lawyers or farmers. And then I had my son. Uh, I was an attorney, an article attorney, uh, came home one night in my smart little car and my smart little black suit, carrying my smart little briefcase, feeling very important. And my son was waiting. This is actually really how it happened. My son sat outside the school waiting for me for the last three hours with the red eyes. He was about six years old. And I decided there, I cannot work as a lawyer, be a mother and raise my child in a city. So I received a job as a farmhand in the Western Cape. At that time, it was a, a apple farm. Uh, my first vintage was a total failure because we had a hailstorm. Uh, um, neighbor drove by, drove by, quite a nice man actually. And he said, why don't I consider vines, grapes? I always loved wine. The next morning, I found Evan Archer and David Simon, the professors of viticulture and soil science here at the Stalemosh University. And they sort of um, was a slightly irritated, but they said, come and see us. I did. And a year later, we started planting vines and it was just an amazing success. So, um, and my son had a wonderful time growing up on a farm in the middle of a nature reserve. So did, did, didn't, I thought you told me Evan Archer told you to come at seven o'clock in the morning thinking he would get rid of you. And at quarter to seven, you were there outside his door. Yeah. Evan tried very hard to get rid of me. He thought I was an irritating young woman at that time. I was there at seven and actually they came through weekend after weekend. I provided the food and the wine and they taught me over a table till the middle of the night we sat and we taught, we spoke viticulture. It was fantastic. It was a very good learning school for me. But how, how did you first get involved with, with old vines? Um, when I started viticulture, I knew I knew nothing. I still think I know very little. Uh, so I had to travel. The best way to actually learn is to travel, to travel to the best winemaking countries in the world. And I went for the last 20 years, I went all over the world 
all over Europe. The only country I haven't visited yet is actually New Zealand and Chile for some strange reason. Should we get you um, an invitation? I'm waiting for the invitation, yes. <laughs> uh, in these countries, I met wonderful people like uh, the Sancerre family, the bourgeois, uh, Ziggy and Arnaud Bourgeois from the Sancerre, Didier Dagenau, Dumain Paul Blanc in Alsace, uh, lots of people, Didier Barol, and they all, I tasted wines with them, and of course in Argentina as well, Asheville Ferrer, and I, I, I'm, I just met wonderful people and they made me taste old wine wines alongside young wine, young vine wines. And to me, I've always grasped the wonderful inner strength of these wines. For me, there's a distinct difference. I was completely mesmerized with a whole uh, strength and character of old wines. And I came back to South Africa and I thought, but Jan van Riebeek was the, the first white guy that set foot here and planted vines in 1657. And I thought, but where's our old vines? They must be hidden away somewhere. And I started looking, got into my car, my bucky, as you know, you've been with me. Oh, no, you have not been with me in my bucky at that time. And I drove all over the country. I went up the West Coast, up the mountains, up to Oatswaran for hours and hours over weekends and found some vines. And then the word started spreading with the farm workers. Um, which you know I work very closely with. And they said to me at some stage of their lives, 20, 30 years ago, there was an old vineyard there, an old vineyard there. So I started visiting these sites and I found these beautiful old vineyards. And then of course the lucky break was when your handful, you, a colleague of mine, told me about Skirfberg. And you know, the rest followed. Yeah. And you then you then established this 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 website called I Am Old, You're Not Old. But that, the site was called I Am Old. And you just did that yourself. But you had, a, you had a list of vineyards, didn't you? Well, at the time, I was not old, yes. Um, I approached Sarvis, our local uh, authority here that regulates vines planted and wines produced at the time, because they could have easily given me the list of old vines, but they didn't want to. They, they deemed it as confidential at the time. So it was, a, it was a hell of a struggle in the beginning. We had to literally find and phone and it was not easy. Um, but then uh, at some stage, uh, Andre joined. Andre started talking to me. We were just trying to figure it out about, th about 2008. Uh, and after that, Savas gave us the, um, the list. And then it was easy. We actually had a list of vines older than 35 years registered. You, you can't produce wine in this country if you're not on that list. So um, Sovis is a fantastic uh, authority in South Africa. And then it was actually easy after that. It was much easier to, to uh, do the list. But the first list was, I'm old. Uh, my, my friends, Nadia and Andre, changed that very quickly, saying it's a silly name. <laughs> I thought it was a very, very good name, but obviously I was wrong. Um, and now it was called the Old Man Project. <laughs> Yeah, and and I, one of the things I like that you've always done with these old vines, when you're given, or someone has told you about the old vines, is you're almost like a matchmaker, that you actually give the vineyard to a winemaker who you think deserves it, in a way. Would that be, would that be accurate for me to say that? You know, that is how it started. I was very jealous and possessive of my old vines in the beginning. <clears throat> but when uh, Eben Sari made the first wine, the Skarfberg Shenan, and Neil Patterson, at the time when I was working also at Lor Marat in Franschhoek, uh, also produced a wine from Skarberg Schenen. And I think that set the standard. After that, it, it was almost as if um, Skarberg was just such a beautiful wine. The standard was set. And years later, uh, now people have to live up to that standard. And it's not easy. I think the winemakers regulate themselves. You know, if they produce wine from old vines and it's not a good wine, they, they don't um, bottle it. But most of the old wine wines that we see today in South Africa are actually really good wines. Yeah. But Andre will tell you more about that. Okay, we'll come on to him in a minute. Tell him to sit out of the photo, out of the picture till his, <laughs> till his time is ready. Is ready. <laughs> I mean, South Africa is a challenging place to grow grapes. I mean, not just because of the climate 
but also because of, of, of virus issues and other things. Wh wh why do some vines survive and others not? And which varieties tend to do best, do you think? Well, um, it's, a, it's a very good question. I think it's often sentimental reasons. You know, if your grandmother or your grandfather planted the vines during the Anglo-Boer War, even before the second, even before the First World War, um, and you want to keep the memory of them alive, you kept the vineyards. I, I go to so many farms where people say, but why don't you take it out? And the farmer will say, well, my grandmother, Auntie Cookie planted it or whatever her name was, and they don't want to take it out. I think that's the one reason, but I do think the other reason is just because it produced good quality wines. I think over the years, the winemakers every year from the co-ops, at that time, the wines were mostly produced by co-ops. The co-op said, don't take it out. It just gives so much more acidity, so much more inner strength to our bulk wines. And they kept it. I think the best vineyards survived because they produced the best wines. Yeah. I mean, some of, them, some of them were in very isolated places, aren't they? Like the footpad, where they were used to make, to make, hooch to make spirit right spirits and that's why they survived right that's right sometimes they were just also uh, produced uh, kept because uh, the farmer got a quota from kwv uh, towards the end um so that that was andre don't interrupt me please yeah, tell him to shut up <laughs> i think that's also why but it's mostly because they um, produce lovely wines, I think. I, for example, at Skurfberg, strangely enough, the first time I got to Skurfberg, I spoke to the winemaker at the co-op at the time, that was 15 years ago, 14 years ago. The winemaker said they don't like the grapes from Skurfberg because the acidity is so high, it eats away at the bin on the inside. I mean, that is ridiculous. <laughs> the one thing we do want in South Africa is high acidity because of our heat. We normally have low acidity, uh, lower acidity, but we have other things to replace it. I mean, t t tell us about farming old vines, because I know you, you're, I mean, you're quite emotional about it, but you're, you're also very analytical and you form these teams. You have a team of, of pruners and vineyard workers who specifically work on these, on these old vine sites a lot of the time. Just tell us about how you treat, do you have to treat them in a different way? Yes, you do. Old vines must be farmed with a lot of attention. Correct pruning is very, very important. And I'll, I'll talk about that just now. Weed control and soil health. I know soil health is a very, very important subject in a dry country like ours. And of course, um, the previous um, speaker mentioned biodiversity. That's uh, very close to my heart. So soil health and biodiversity is a very important part of that. I think purity of air and romantic things like that also plays a role. That's where maybe why Skurfberg is so great and the footpath is so great because it stands in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing around it, but wheat or feinbos and leopards and cows and sheep sometimes. So maybe that plays a role at the biodiversity. If you have a biodiverse vineyard, you less, use less insecticides um, and that's of course is, is, uh, helps with the vineyards. Um, we try to fertilize them with organic fertilizer, definitely not with hard chemicals. And we always try to keep smaller canopies yeah. rather than pushing vigor with fertilizer. A lean vine can run further in a heat wave. We believe also that old vines will tell you how to manage them. There is no definite recipe for old vine old vineyards. If, you're, if, if you know how to listen, right? Yeah, you just have to stand back and listen to it and it tell you, will tell you what it needs. Just look at it and try to put yourself in, in, in their shoes. I mean, they've been there for hundreds of years and they reflect the seasons and the past climates through their grapes. They're self-regulating. So if you come to a vineyard and you have to prune it, look at it, see what the yield was the previous year, and never prune into old wood. I know in California and in Europe, they like cut with loppers and all sorts of things into old wood. We don't do that here at all. We believe in only working with a strong wood, the healthy wood, and recreating the vine from the strong wood. And we have done that. We have done that many times here. And it works. Is that something that you've developed or was it something you learned from people like Evan Archer? No, 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 no. That's something I learned 
with my farm workers, the guys that work with me, by looking at vines. We just looked at it and I said to them, if you were that vine, how would you want to be pruned? That's literally what we've done. And it, it really, we, we sometimes recreating a new vine from a, a vine that's almost dying. There's one piece of wood that's, that has life. And we're recreating a, vine, a new vine from that one shoot. I mean, last question, it's more of a comment, really. I mean, I, I, whenever I'm in vineyards with you, I love the fact that you have this incredible intuition. It's almost like a, you have an emotional connection with the vine. I mean, it seems that Salvo was talking about, I don't grow vineyards, I don't farm vineyards, I farm vines. You know, I've seen that with you where, you know, you're, you're almost, yeah, I mean, you're very emotional about the connection sometimes. Is that true? Yes. I prepared an answer for you because you've <laughs> seen me this before. No, just tell us, don't read out. <laughs> I had to think about this so carefully, and this is very true. Old vines and Skirbach in particular, you've been to Skirbach with me. It is just a magical place. Yeah. It is just so magical. Uh, they link me to my history and to my ancestors and to all the people that work the land in these fields for sometimes a hundred years, sometimes 130, 140 years. People work there and I can feel it. I think it gives one a sense of security uh, a sense that we can survive the most taxing of times. And this is a very emotional statement, I, I know. But I sense that when I talk to people with old vineyards, even the farmers and the farm workers, they say, if they could have survived in even in the ta most taxing of times, why can't we just hang on, just don't give up? And of course, it humbles you and it makes you emotional. And that's why I love old vines. That's one of the reasons why I love old vines, also because they produce wonderful wines, of course. Yeah. I mean, that, I, the, I went, when we were at Basi, I'm glad, I'm glad you're drinking as well. Fantastic. There we go. I hope you're drinking an old vine. Why? That when we were at Skirfberg with Basi and we went up to the top of the farm and you can still see where, where the Boers during the, the Anglo-Boer War used to sit on top of this mountain and look all along the West Coast to see when the Brits were coming. And you can find old, old gun, you know, casements. You can find tins, you know, old tins they used to eat. And you are, you're connected, as you said, to... To, to history and a history of, of struggle. I mean, South Africa is, 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 a, is, is a very powerful place. I think there, there's a saying, I'm not, I know Nelson Mandela, the, the great Nelson Mandela said it once that you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you're coming from. Yeah. And I think in a sense, Old Vines gives you that. Like they, that. You can just learn from them and you can yeah. just sit back and respect them. Yeah. And not interfere too much. Don't work them too hard and don't try to manipulate them too much. Just go lightly. Yeah. Treat lightly. Yeah. Go That's lightly. It. I love that. Thank you, Rosa. Fantastic. Now, what's going to happen? We're going to swing around to Andre. Or is Andre going to join us in the, in the yes, hot seat? I'm going to leave my seat and Andre's going to join my seat. <laughs> love to see you. Hello, Andre. <laughs> How are you doing? Good to see you. How's it? Right, Andre's going to tell us a bit more about the Orban project. I just want you to just tell us. I mean, Rosa told us a little bit the, about the I Am Old uh, and how that started. Just tell us about how the Old Vine Project specifically started. Who, who funds it? Who runs it? How many members do you have? Well, as Rosa explained, I mean, this has been going on for almost 20 years now. I mean, people always talk about, we, we, we started in 2016 in August when Rosa approached me and said that she um, received funding from uh, Mr. Rupert, seed funding to start the Old Vine Project. She, they've been talking about that for many years. And um, it went from there that in four or five years, you, you talk about members, we, we were about, before lockdown, 70 members. When we started in 2017, we were eight members. Yeah. And uh, Nadia tells us this afternoon that uh, it looks like we'll be at 100 members by the end of the month, which is- but Because of this conference. <laughs> it's amazing the power of this conference right? well I, i'll have to thank uh, sarah and yourself and madeleine for, for the conference and Russ and i've been talking about this for quite a while to do something similar but COVID, um you know didn't work out for us and i think this is a valuable opportunity for us to tell our story and, and, and just tell us what impact ovp has had on the South African wine industry. I mean, Rosa was telling this story that a lot of the best vineyards were inside, locked inside cooperatives. And even if the co-ops knew they made good grapes, they didn't always make the wines on their own. How, how have, you know, you've done an amazing job with this project. How, how has it changed thinking in South Africa? 
Well, well, thank you for that. Um, and as you might remember, you, know, you were one of the first itineraries that I developed when I was still with Wines East Africa in 2001, I think. Uh, and I am old. <laughs> <laughs> and so you never really saw the carbs and I think recently which was significant for us is when we at Rissa's home showed you a lineup of carp old vine wines yeah. when I four years ago started going to the carbs and 85% of our old vineyards are tied up in those systems I don't know if you know what it is to go and talk to a farmer which is the director of a carp it's like and he's like probably, six, probably six foot four and used to be a spring box second row or something right <laughs> so i mean to break through that system it's almost impossible and we are lucky to have i think not a five six carpet major cooperatives as members now which number one started their own old vine wines which you've tasted and secondly they've unlocked vineyards to our members and we are saving vineyards. Um, just to look at the figures, I mean, we started with just under 3000 hectares um, of old vine vineyards. In the last couple of years, it, it increased by, by almost a thousand hectares. So let's say three, three and a half thousand hectares is, or three, 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 three thousand six hundred hectares is currently uh, part of the 90,000 of total. Yes. So that's a very small percentage, but we, we're growing it and we're getting the sentiment through to people to keep the vineyard in the ground and respect the vineyard as, as Rosa explained. And are, are you seeing higher prices both for old vine fruit, uh, but also for old vine wines? But you can tell us maybe after that a bit about the seal and how you market it, but tell us about the prices of fruit and of the, of the wines, first of all. I've got a beautiful story to share with you um, to illustrate that. When Rissa arrived in Skirfberg the first time, she met, with, she met with Henk Lang. The family was destitute. They were desperate to make money. They were pulling out vineyards, planting fruit that was high yielding. And um, he just said, since Rissa arrived and started selling grapes to Ibn Saadi and the Malinus and Alat and so forth, and even more after that, um, they increased the grape price per ton from roughly 2,000 rand a ton to the co-op and is now 10, 15, 20,000 rand a ton. So it's not the golden bullet, but they can buy a new tractor. And the beautiful story of this is that they've managed to put the kids through university with old vine money. Yeah. That's so it has an impact on grape prices. And that's, that's one of the challenges that we had from the beginning is to develop a business model that is workable and sustainable for the growers and for the workers on the farms. And then in terms of wine prices, uh, Jonathan Stain um, is running a, a research project uh, via UCT GSB. And the first round proved that people are willing to pay more per bottle, an average of 300 Rand a bottle, uh, if it says old vine on, on, on the uh, front label. The current research is about the seal. Tell us about the seal. The seal is probably the most important aspect of the old vine project in South Africa because it, it's the only thing that differentiates us from everybody else. There's no one else that can actually have the traceability, as Rissa explained with Salvas. Our planting dates, it goes back to 1900. We can trace each vineyard when it was planted, and that gives the consumer uh, um, an idea of the quality of the wine, and as I said, traceability um, and the authenticity, that's the most important part of it. That gives us teeth. And, and, and what about this, the age limit? 35 years is your definition of an old vine. That would be, that would be deemed quite, quite young if you, uh, you know, if you were in Spain, for example, uh, or maybe on Etna, where, where Salvo was talking. Um, yeah. How did you come up with 35 years? That's, um, that's ironic that South Africa took the lead and um, created the category with 35 years. But when I, when I was at uh, Provine two years ago, I had the privilege to walk to my counterparts in each country. Um, Nadia and I were joking. I would tell her, okay, I'm, I'm just leaving Australia now on, on the way to Chile. And she said, I'm still in Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'll, I had meetings with, with, with um, uh, I think Stuart's talking uh, about Lodi tomorrow. Yeah. Um, Barossa, 
wines of Australia, uh, Napa, uh, Portugal, Spain. And the, the, the agreement was that 35 years is sort of when a, a vineyard comes into balance. And I always use the analogy of when we were students in our 20s, we never thought that, you know, we'll reach 30. And once you reach your 30s, then in theory, some of us get it right. Um, we'll, have a, we'll have a family and a career and um, bribe with the dogs on Sunday and not be partying the whole weekend in, in discos and so on. So um, that's what we see with, with old vines. That's what we decided in 35, 35 to 40 years, where we had to pin it somewhere you know, to, to, to shape the category. I mean, last question is, I mean, you've spoken to all these people at Provine when Provine still happened two years ago. Um, how do you, do you think there's, there's a possibility maybe growing out of this conference to establish something globally where all of these local or national organizations are linked in some way? This discussion at, was at Provine with, with everybody that we want to do something international. Uh, we are looking at something in South Africa when things ease up that we can have um, international visitors, winemakers, taste international wines and discuss similar sort of format. Um, yeah, so internationalization has always been on the books, but it's been difficult the last two years to actually realize. Fantastic. But, but international cooperation is important for us. Uh, we feel that um, all the noise is important around uh, old vines. Yeah. Even though we started it and we're leading it with the seal and everything, but we want to work together with everybody else. Fantastic. So watch this space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Great to talk to you guys. Sarah, back to you.